Chapter Ten of the Doings of Raffles Haw by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Great Secret. And so Laura McIntyre became duly engaged to Raffles Haw, and old McIntyre grew even more hungry looking as he felt himself a step nearer to the source of wealth while Robert thought less of work than ever, and never gave as much as a thought to the great canvas which still stood dust-covered upon his easel. He gave Laura an engagement ring of old gold, with a great blazing diamond bulging out of it. There was little talk about the matter, however, for it was Haw's wish that all should be done very quietly. Nearly all his evenings were spent at Elmdene, where he and Laura would build up the most colossal schemes of philanthropy for the future. With a map stretched out on the table in front of them, these two young people would, as it were, hover over the world, planning, devising, and improving. "'Bless the girl,' said old McIntyre to his son. "'She speaks about it as if she were born to millions. Maybe, when once she's married, she won't be so ready to chuck her money into every mad scheme that her husband can think of.' "'Laura is greatly changed,' Robert answered. "'She has grown much more serious in her ideas.' "'You wait a bit,' sniggered his father. "'She is a good girl, is Laura, and she knows what she is about. "'She's not a girl to let her old dad go to the wall if she can set him right. "'It's a pretty state of things,' he added bitterly. "'Here's my daughter going to marry a man who thinks no more of gold than I used to of gunmetal, "'and here's my son going about with all the money he cares to ask for "'to help every ne'er-do-well in Stratfordshire. "'And here's their father, who loved them and cared for them and brought them up, without money enough very often to buy a bottle of brandy. I don't know what you poor dear mother would have thought of it. You have only to ask for what you want. Yes, as if I were a five-year-old child. But I tell you, Robert, I have my rights, and if I can't get them one way, I will another. I won't be treated as if I were no one. And there's one thing. If I am able to be this man's paw-in-law, I'll want to know something about him and his money first. We may be poor, but we are honest." I'll up to the hall now, and have it out with him. He seized his hat and stick, and made for the door. No, no, father, cried Robert, catching him by the sleeve. You had better leave the matter alone. Mr. Haw is a very sensitive man. He would not like to be examined upon such a point. It might lead to a serious quarrel. I beg that you will not go. I am not to be put off forever, snarled the old man, who had been drinking heavily. I'll put my foot down once and forever. He tugged at his sleeve to free himself from his son's grasp. "'At least you shall not go without Laura knowing. I will calm her down, and we shall have her opinion.' "'Oh, I don't want to have any scenes,' said McIntyre sulkily, relaxing his efforts. He lived in dread of his daughter, and at his worst moments the mention of her name would serve to restrain him. "'Besides,' said Robert, "'I have not the slightest doubt that Raffles Hall will see the necessity of giving us some sort of explanation before Mathers go further.' He must understand that we have some claim now to be taken into his confidence. He had hardly spoken when there was a tap on the door, and the man of whom they were speaking walked in. "'Good morning, Mr. McIntyre,' he said. "'Robert, would you mind stepping up to the hall with me? I want to have a little business chat.' He looked serious, like a man who was carrying out something which he has well weighed. They walked up together with hardly a word on either side. Raffles Haw was absorbed in his own thoughts. Robert felt expectant and nervous, for he knew that something of importance lay before him. The winter had almost passed now, and the first young shoots were beginning to peep out timidly in the face of the wind and the rain of an English march. The snows were gone, but the countryside looked bleaker and drearier, all shrouded in the haze from the damp, sodden meadows. "'By the way, Robert,' said Raffles Haw, suddenly, as they walked up the avenue, "'has your great Roman picture gone to London?' I have not finished it yet. But I know you are a quick worker. You must be nearly at the end of it. No, I am afraid that it has not advanced much since you saw it. For one thing, the light has not been very good. Raffles Haw said nothing, but a pained expression flashed over his face. When they reached the house, he led the way through the museum. Two great metal cases were lying on the floor. I have made a small addition there to the gem collection, he remarked as he passed. They only arrived last night and I have not yet opened them. But I am given to understand from the letters and invoices that there are some fine specimens. We might arrange them this afternoon, if you care to assist me. 
let us go into the smoking room now he threw himself down into a settee and motioned robert into the armchair in front of him light a cigar he said press the spring if there is any refreshment which you would like now my dear robert confess to me in the first place that you have often thought me mad the charge was so direct and so true that the young artist hesitated hardly knowing how to answer my dear boy i do not blame you it is the most natural thing in the world i should have looked upon any one as a madman who had talked to me as i have talked to you but for all that robert you were wrong and i have never yet in our conversations proposed any scheme which is not well within my power to carry out i tell you in all sober earnest that the amount of my income is limited only by my desire and that all the bankers and financiers combined could not furnish the sums which i can put forward without any effort i have ample proof of your immense wealth said robert and you are very naturally curious as to how that wealth was obtained well i can tell you one thing the money is perfectly clean i have robbed no one cheated no one sweated no one ground no one down in the gaining of it i can read your father's eye robert i can see that he has done me an injustice in this matter well perhaps he is not to be blamed perhaps i also might think uncharitable things if i were in his place but that is why i now give an explanation to you robert and not to him you at least have trusted me and you have a right before i become one of your family to know all that i can tell you laura also has trusted me but i know well that she is content still to trust me i would not intrude upon your secrets mr haw said robert but of course i cannot deny that i should be very proud and pleased if you cared to confide them in me and i will not all i do not think i shall ever while i live tell all but i shall leave directions behind me so that when i die you may be able to carry on my unfinished work i shall tell you where those directions are to be found in the meantime you must be content to learn the effects which i produce without knowing every detail as to the means robert settled himself down in his chair and concentrated his attention upon his companion's words while haw bent forward his eager earnest face like a man who knows the value of the words which he is saying you are already aware he remarked that i have devoted a great deal of energy and time to the study of chemistry so you told me i commenced my studies under a famous english chemist i continued them under the best man in france and i completed them in the most celebrated laboratory in germany i was not rich but my father had left me enough to keep me comfortably and by living economically i had a sum at my command which enabled me to carry out my studies in a very complete way when i returned to england i built myself a laboratory in a quiet country place where i could work without distraction or interruption there i began a series of investigations which soon took me into regions of science to which none of the three famous men who taught me had ever penetrated you say robert that you have some slight knowledge of chemistry and you will find it easier to follow what i say chemistry is to a large extent an empirical science and the chance experiment may lead to greater results that could with our present data be derived from the closest study or the keenest reasoning the most important chemical discoveries from the first manufacture of glass to the whitening and refining of sugar have all been due to some happy chance which might have befallen a mere dabbler as easy as a deep student well it was to such a chance that my own great discovery perhaps the greatest that the world has seen was due though i may claim the credit of having originated the line of thought which led up to it i had frequently speculated as to the effect which powerful currents of electricity exercise upon any substance through which they are poured for a considerable time i did not here mean such feeble currents as are passed along a telegraph wire i mean the very highest possible developments well i tried a series of experiments upon this point i found that in liquids and in compounds the force had a disintegrating effect the well-known experiment of the electrolysis of water will of course occur to you but i found that in the case of elemental solids the effect was a remarkable one the element slowly decreased in weight without perceptibly altering in composition i hope i make myself clear to you i follow you entirely said robert deeply interested in his companion's narrative i have tried upon several elements and always with the same result in every case an hour's current would produce a perceptible loss of weight 
My theory at that stage was that there was a loosening of the molecules caused by the electric fluid, and that a certain number of these molecules were shut off like an impalpable dust all round the lump of earth or of metal, which remained, of course, the lighter by their loss. I had entirely accepted this theory when a very remarkable chance led me to completely alter my opinions. I had, one Saturday night, fastened a bar of bismuth in a clamp, and had attached it on either side to an electric wire, in order to observe what effect the current would have upon it. I had been testing each metal in turn, exposing them to the influence for one to two hours. I had just got everything in position, and had completed my connection, when I received a telegram to say that John Stillingfleet, an old chemist in London with whom I had been on terms of intimacy, was dangerously ill and had expressed a wish to see me. The last train was due to leave in twenty minutes, and I lived a good mile from the station. I thrust a few things into a bag, locked my laboratory, and ran as hard as I could to catch it. It was not until I was in London that it suddenly occurred to me that I had neglected to shut off the current, and that it would continue to pass through the bar of bismuth until the batteries were exhausted. The fact, however, seemed to be of small importance, and I dismissed it from my mind. I was detained in London until the Tuesday night, and it was Wednesday morning before I could get back to my work. As I unlocked the laboratory door, my mind reverted to the uncompleted experiment, and it struck me that, in all probability, my piece of bismuth would have been entirely disintegrated and reduced to its primitive molecules. I was utterly unprepared for the truth. When I approached the table, I found that, sure enough, the bar of metal had vanished, and the clamp was empty. Having noted the fact, I was about to turn away to something else, when my attention was attached to the fact that the table upon which the clamp stood was starred over with little patches of some liquid silvery matter, which lay in single drops or coalesced into little pools. I had a very distinct recollection of having thoroughly cleared the table before beginning my experiment, so that this substance had been deposited there since I left for London. Much interested, I very carefully collected it all into one vessel and examined it minutely. There could be no question as to what it was. It was the purest mercury, and gave no response to any test for bismuth. I had once grasped the fact that change had placed in my hands a chemical discovery of the very first importance. If bismuth were, under certain conditions, to be subjected to the action of electricity, it would begin by losing weight, and would finally be transformed into mercury. I had broken down the partitions which separated two elements. But the process would be a constant one. It would presumably prove to be a general law, and not an isolated fact. If bismuth turned into mercury, what would mercury turn into? There would be no rest for me until I had solved the question. I renewed the exhausted batteries and passed the current through the bowl of quicksilver. For sixteen hours I watched the metal, marking how it slowly seemed to, to curdle, to grow firmer, to lose its silvery glitter, and to take a dull yellow hue. When I at last picked it up in a forceps and threw it upon the table, it had lost every characteristic of mercury, and had obviously become another metal. A few simple tests were enough to show me that this other metal was platinum. Now to a chemist there was something very suggestive in the order in which these changes had been effected. Perhaps you can see the relation, Robert, which they bear to each other? No, I cannot say that I do. Robert had sat listening to this strange statement with parted lips and staring eyes. I will show you. Speaking atomically, bismuth is the heaviest of the metals. Its atomic weight is 210. The next in weight is lead, 207, and then comes mercury at 200. Possibly during the long period which had acted in my absence had reduced the bismuth to lead, and the lead in turn to mercury. Now platinum stands at 197.5, and it was accordingly the next metal to be produced by the continued current. Do you see now? It is quite clear. And then there came the inference which sent my heart into my mouth and caused my head to swim round. Gold is the next in the series. Its atomic weight is 197. I remembered now, and for the first time understood why it was always lead and mercury which were mentioned by the old alchemist as being the two metals which might be used in their calling. With fingers which trembled with excitement, I adjusted the wires again, and, in a little more than an hour, for the length of the process is always in proportion to the difference in the metals, I had before me a knob of ruddy, crinkled metal, which answered to every reaction for gold. 
well robert this is a long story but i think you will agree with me that its importance justifies me in going into detail when i had satisfied that i had really manufactured gold i cut the nugget in two one half i sent to a jeweller and worker in precious metals with whom i had some slight acquaintance asking him to report upon the quality of the gold with the other half i continued my series of experiments and it reduced it in successive stages through all the long series of metals through silver and zinc and manganese until i brought it to lithium which is the lightest of all and what did it turn then asked robert then came what to chemists is likely to be the most interesting portion of my discovery it turned into a grayish fine powder which powder gave no further results however much i might treat it with electricity and that powder is the base of all things it is the mother of all elements it is in short the substance whose existence has been recently surmised by a leading chemist and which has been christened protyle by him i am the discoverer of the great law of the electrical transposition of the metals and i am the first to demonstrate protyle so that i think robert if all my schemes in other directions come to nothing my name is at least likely to live in the chemical world there is not very much more for me to tell you i had my nugget back from my friend the jeweller confirming my opinion as to its nature and its quality i soon found several methods by which the process might be simplified and especially a modification of the ordinary electric current which was very much more effective having made a certain amount of gold i disposed of it for a sum which enabled me to buy improved materials and in stronger batteries in this way i enlarged my operation until at last i was in a position to build this house and to have a laboratory where i could carry out my work on a much larger scale as i said before i can now state with all truth that the amount of my income is only limited by my desires it is wonderful gasped robert it is like a fairy tale but with this great discovery in your mind you must have been sorely tempted to confide it to others i thought well over it i gave it every consideration it was obvious to me that if my invention were made public its immediate result would be to deprive the present precious metals of their special value some other substance amber we will say or ivory would be chosen as a medium for barter and gold would be inferior to brass as being heavier and yet not so hard now no one would be the better for such a consummation as that now if i retained my secret and used it with wisdom i might make myself the greatest benefactor to mankind that has ever lived those were the chief reasons and i trust they are not dishonourable ones which led me to form the resolution which i have to-day for the first time broken but your secret is safe with me cried robert my lips shall be sealed until i have your permission to speak if i had not known that i could trust you i should have withheld it from your knowledge and now my dear robert theory is very weak work and practice is infinitely more interesting i have given you more than enough of the first if you will be good enough to accompany me to the laboratory i shall give you a little of the latter End of chapter ten